Excellent, and welcome to uh, TAD Summit Asia. We've got a panel discussion, and this is going to be on the Universal Telecom API in Asia. So I'm just going to do a quick introduction. Uh, everybody should know me. Uh, what I'd like to do is, Dinesh, would you please introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Alan. Uh, I'm Dinesh Sakuramad. I'm the founder and the CEO of Senid Mobile. So we are almost uh, 14 years in the mobile uh, software platform play. And uh, we are actually, we launched um, IdeaMart, which is the C++ platform. And we'll talk about it a little bit more later, uh, almost uh, five years ago. And even today, uh, it's actually one of the most successful platforms uh, in the whole C++. So good to be here, Alan, and uh, looking forward for a good conversation. No, excellent. I'm really pleased you're able to join us, Dinesh. Thank you so much. And Mark, please introduce yourself. Hi, Alan. Alan, it's a privilege to be here. I feel like I've been at TADS since the dawn of TADS, um, having been at the first event in Bangkok in 2013. Um, That's which correct. Um, my name is Mark White. Um, I, I have been involved with TADS for quite a long time. Previously, I was the founder and CEO of an Australian company called Locatrix Communications. Uh, we were probably uh, pretty big pioneers in Australia in terms of mobile location services and a bunch of other value-added services we did for a bunch of operators, most notably in Australia with Telstra. Um, in 2018, I exited that company, sold it to a public safety uh, company in Australia, and uh, 2019 moved to Singapore, and now I'm working with the Quorum Group, who's one of the leaders in technology and software mergers and acquisitions advisory services. Um, so really enjoying that, and but still very much keeping involved with... Uh, what's going on in the telecommunications sector. So it's great to be part of this panel. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mark. And moving on to Craig. Hi, Alan. Uh, yeah, Craig Richards, uh, VP for Product and Engineering at Appigate. Um, Appigate's part of Axiata Digital Services. Uh, and we, we started as a, an internal API project across all of the operators in the in the, in the um, uh, Axiata group. And uh, eventually we spun out as part of um, Axiata Digital Services as a separate business. Excellent. Thank you, Craig. And you've already heard from him, but uh, Sebastian, please introduce yourself. Yeah, hey, guys, it's Sebastian. Um, I'm with TAD also for a long time, not since 2013. It was a bit too far back then, but since Istanbul 2014. Um, attended TAD's, uh, TAD Hacks as well. Um, and yeah, I work for Deutsche Telekom now. I've been with the group for a long time from Slovak Telecom over to Immer. Um, which was a startup running on top of a CPaaS that we've built um, together with a, a company. And since 2018, I'm uh, working in the department responsible for the intercarrier platform. And there I'm focusing basically on getting a bit more traction on the whole CPaaS topic inside uh, the company. Excellent. Thank you, Sebastian. And last but definitely not least, Martin. Yeah. Hey, I'm a newcomer to TEDS. Uh, my last, my first and last TED was last year in London. Um, I've been working in, a, in research, uh, computer science, uh, somehow by coincidence ended up in a carrier research department as the only uh, software engineer there, funny enough. But um, so I, I have some history in trying to do everything in software, that's networks and everything that comes on top of networks. I was the founder of the spin-off, what uh, that was called Immer that Sebastian mentioned. And Sebastian was my VP engineer and that, so we know each other from that time. Um, after I left the, the big companies, I found Automat, and uh, now we work for um, the players in the market as the CPAS players and carriers still. So I changed sites towards the, let's say, developing software for the players. Yeah, Excellent. That's... Thank you, Martin. So what we're going to do is just do a little round robin where each of the panelists will uh, ask Sebastian and Martin some questions on their presentations. They've done their homework. So uh, looking forward to uh, the uh, discussion. So maybe uh, we can kick off with Dinesh. Do you have any questions for Sebastian or Martin? Oh, yeah. Your audio. There you go. So, like I uh, mentioned, I think Sebastian, it was a great presentation that you put together. You know, so I think there was a, quite a lot of uh, insights as being a CPAS uh, player and how you kind of looked at the landscape. So, one question that I was actually going to ask, I think I have a couple of questions, but one is, you know, you mentioned about some of the WebRTC and especially 
with what happening currently i think there's a quite a lot of uh, need for people when they start working from home and you know creating maybe certain certain you know apis that are being exposed from the telcos and how do you think that the telcos are going to kind of look at web rtc and is there a way that they will start incorporating into in their own way of kind of monetizing that yeah it's a good question actually quite uh, quite relevant um what I think is when it comes to um, complete service offerings, such as we see on uh, Zoom and WebEx, I think um, here they will partner more than actually build their own services, right? Because it's, um, I think these companies are um, pretty good and I think um, a partnering model makes a bit more sense here. But what I definitely think uh, when it comes to WebRTC is that um, carriers will provide enablers, right? Maybe not necessarily for those companies that do um, conferencing at their heart, but I think certainly part of the um, CPaaS stack and API stack carriers will need to offer, besides exposing APIs directly to their assets, is of course a layer that's not really um, depending on their, uh, let's say, legacy network, but it's really um, enabling uh, companies um, also for um, peer-to-peer or, or multi-party conversation. Um, and uh, what I can imagine is also that they will run parts of the web policy infrastructure for other players. So, for example, they could run a turn server, they could run um, other uh, processing heavy engines because they um, they have it in their networks, actually. Um, they might build up new platforms where the capabilities are, they know how to scale infrastructure. Um, and I think that's quite a good share to care about enabling others, care about the infrastructure, and leave the actual experience um, in parts to partners. and where it makes sense also um, shape it a bit. But I think, um, yeah, I think that will come as a second step, right? That carriers will consume these enablers. I think at the first step, uh, they will provide them um, to other parties building the service on top of that. Cool, excellent. Do you have any other questions, Dinesh? Yeah, maybe I can come back uh, around a little bit. Yeah, I actually have a couple of more, but let's Okay, we'll back. do it around. Mark, over to you. Hey, thanks, Alan. Hey, guys, great presentations both. I really enjoyed them. I, I think the um, there's a couple of points, I'm, and I might address the first question to Martin because uh, one that I'm particularly fond of, of talking about. Um, and I, I, and I apologise if I don't get the terminology correct, but you spoke about the, um, the I guess the carriers, the CSPs, and then the CPaaS enabling layer, and the folks who are building basic CPaaS capabilities on top of the on top of the, the services. And then you spoke about that value value layer on top. And I think, I, I can't remember, again, I, I, I apologize for the exact terminology, but you were talking about some of the neat things that some, uh, and I think you call them gold-plated CSPs, were at, oh, sorry, uh, CPaaS providers, were adding on top. It was the, the likes of artificial intelligence, uh, speech recognition, maybe some AI capabilities on top of the, the, the what is basically a messaging and or audio video stream capability. And one of the things that I have sort of held uh, uh, and been, been a little bit vocal inside TADS previously was that the likes of, um, if you look at the finance industry, you know, there's been a really clear enablement of basic access to customer and customer details. And the fintech space has been all about that value-added layer. One of the things that I kind of worry and lament a little bit about the, uh, uh, you know, us in the telecoms environment is, you know, we're still trying to struggle with that basic enablement of CPAS. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're all talking about use cases around two-factor authentication with SMS and maybe a basic audio stream for a call or a conference call. Um, you know, going forward, you see, I mean, why is it that we're still struggling with the basics? Is it because the, uh, the incumbents, the folks actually holding the CSP keys have been a little bit slow to move? Or do you think that it's something related to the, the lack of innovation in the communication space as, as a rule? So my, my, my direct uh, self-experience is a couple of years back, but it was with Deutsche Telekom, yeah, one of the big ones. And, uh, and Sebastian still knows, I guess. So um, if you come up and tell them about the use cases and you know, what can be done with a programmable approach, and uh, then you try to convince them, say, hey, you're sitting on the on this, you know, on this box of really, really uh, good assets, right? You just use it in a different way, right? And then they just, the first thing they always ask you is, what is the business case? And please compare it to my 70 billion 
annual <laughs> revenue, right? It's like, no, and if you say the biggest player on that market, which you described to me is Twilio, and they do like, I don't know, just a small, a small share of what we do, just go away, right? And uh, so this is like maybe the from the internal perspective of a carrier, that's the usual way it goes, right? There are not many people. Um, if you look into like some good examples, I'd say like let's take the AT and T API marketplace and the KPN, the Dutch guys, right? And the US, the, the US they provide an API marketplace for communication assets, and they use their own infrastructure. As far as I know, what you can see from the outside, KPN we have some insights. They provide other people's APIs for communication scenarios and other provide. They don't even use their own trunks, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, since we work for them, I, I know some more details. It's like I ask, like why why wouldn't you use your own trunks? They are, you know, complicated, high quality, and there's other sales channels and uh, the established. Uh, world uh, doesn't like it why would we do that so it's uh, um, i think it's uh, it could be hard. like the, the simple enablement would be easy you just go to Weso or to Telstex or the alike right there are enough people out there doing this it would be just another software software project right and sebastian he does it right so it's not it's not really complex it's just another software project that doesn't even have a lot of uh, Dependencies could be done in a pretty short time and uh, it's not even expensive. That's not the problem. So doing yet another software project is not a problem. There are providers, they can do that. It's more on the why do I need to do that, right? Their wholesale departments, they they say, oh, I, I, I leave the, the difficult part to sell this via the internet to the guys I partner with, at Twilio and Nexmo and the others. So why would I do the complicated stuff, right? And if you, don't, if you then comment what you just said, you know, the use cases of uh, two-factor authentication, we had some pricing compar comparison, I think uh, Sebastian still has it, right? Yeah. Um, that they take, uh, that's what we call the fairy dust, right? It's like, what, what is just 10 lines of JavaScript code to do a fucking two-factor authentication? It's nothing, right? It's nothing. It's an SMS, right? And some piece of software. And they take twice or four times the price they they take for an SMS, and uh, so and you do that again and again and again, you don't change the software. It's, it's always this, this simple snippet of software, but they can sell it like hell. And then and there was no way to, to convince the people, right? They say, "Well, oh, no, you know, we're not used to the business model. We cannot market it." So they are not even afraid of the technical project, uh, which is right. They should not be, but it's more like oh, it's a different field. We don't. And then this, the next big thing I think is they could leave their footprint. And my personal experience is that they're afraid of leaving the footprint. They're just so used to be on their footprint because they know the clients, they know how everything works, they know the competitors, and they only see other carriers as competitors. They don't see Twilio as a competitor, but just by looking at the sheer revenue size. So that's uh, a couple of topics I'd say that that would be reasons for my experience. Of course, there might be others, but this is uh, maybe, maybe, I hope it answers your questions. But do you think that's holding back the, the, the entire industry, that focus of, well, we sort of see this stuff as kind of peripheral. We've got this core multi-billion dollar business. We've made a, you know, a, a massive ton of, of capital investment to build this network. Um, we've got this stuff over here. It just isn't interesting to us. And do you think that's actually holding back innovation across the entire industry? Yeah. yeah I, or you could actually even, they're still so good in the business that they don't need to, basically. That's... Uh, yeah. That's another perspective. And uh, and that there's another thing is like if the CPAS providers provided to developers, that was the first approach for many years. They provide something that is actually uh, usable from a developer's perspective, then carriers do not have any footprint in, in here, right? They don't have a reputation. They don't know how developers work, they, how they think, what they need and why they need it. So, but now when you see a Twilio, right, that's what we call a fairy dust, right? So the, the, the gold plating of the infrastructure is pretty simple. You just put APIs and then have some SDKs and that's it. Developers, there's a target group, right? And, uh, but now Twilio is actually really going into the domain of the carriers, right? Uh, we have, there's, there's another good example, which is KPN. And uh, I think it's ING Diva, right? So like it's the, 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 the bank, the, the Dutch bank that, that goes global, right? The ING group, um, they moved away their call centers and they're global, right? They have global call centers all over the place. Uh, it's part because they, they, they're purely online. So they do everything via the, the call centers. They moved away from KPN as a carrier 
and they're Dutch. I mean, they're Dutch, right? And in, in the Netherlands, you don't do this, right? You don't do this. You don't go away from the KPN as a provider. But they they, they moved to Twilio because they they removed all the data, their call centers to Twilio because Twilio is providing call center as a service. Let's call it that way. They call it a little different, but. Uh, and then you just look at it and it's like, wow, but it's expensive, right? It's uh, the Twilio stuff is really expensive. Why would someone move away um, to Twilio to do their co base, uh, the global call centers? Basically, first of all, they're global, right? They provide connectivity, calling everything on a global scale. And secondly, you can configure whatever you want, right? It's your, your, your... So they went for the more expensive version with the higher flexibility. So they, there is a good, it's, it's a YouTube uh, video actually, there's a good video uh, from the ING people explaining why they do this. Uh, so this is a, it's a good example, right? Uh, they're, they're actually losing on their own field, right? Uh, and I guess maybe if that takes, if that goes on like this, uh, then my, the, 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 the telco industry may actually change mind because it's talking business basically. And uh, that was a big deal. So KPM is suffering from that because uh, one of their biggest call center clients moved yeah. to these crazy, these crazy companies, right? So, so uh, there are some examples and it might change, but still I think it's not harming the business too much. Yeah, it's, we're early days. I and mean, that's a, a very good point. And the, the, you know, the, the inertia of legacy keeps holding it back. So moving on to Craig, do you have any questions for Sebastian or Martin? Oh, you're, uh, Craig, we can't hear you. You're mute. I'm mute. There you go. Do that all the time. <laughs> uh, yes, firstly, Martin, I, I do like the, um, the terms, the gold plating and the fairy dust, and I'm going to try and adopt those and use them where I can. But uh, my question is for Sebastian. Sebastian, in your, one of, in your uh, presentation, you noted that um, when getting started, that standards aren't really that important. Um, do you, we've, we've been talking about our gold plating now for about 15 years, to be honest. I think at least that long ago that I first started to hear about telecoms APIs and putting APIs on top of telco services. Do you, two questions, I guess. Do, do you think that the obsession with standards, like one API, et cetera, has held us back? Uh, and secondly, uh, do you think we're getting over the need for standards and, and we would take an approach where, you know, the, the, the leader of the market is the winner? Um, I think I wouldn't say that um, like one API held us back. I think what held us back is that um, those who wanted to do things differently were held back or weren't allowed to. I think it's fine if um, uh, on a global scale or GSMA or organizations that are there, um, if they're doing this um, and there are people volunteering and carriers are actually with, get, a, get an assignment to, to contribute there. What I think isn't good is relying on that and saying, well, don't worry, uh, you don't need to do anything in this area because we have it covered by the GSMA. I think that's a mistake um, and, um, and it's actually not, not revised, right? So I've been in a RCS panel a couple of years ago in Berlin where somebody from Avenir said, you know, if we are next year in this round again, we should question ourselves if it's the right thing we're doing. And I've been <laughs> on a panel with... Um, even um, a colleague um, is now in the GSMA um, who was saying, you know, um, we'll see in the next couple of years uh, the, how it gets traction and so on. And, and, you know, a couple of years was the, was the unit there. And I think this, that's the biggest problem that we're really um, still measuring the success like this. I think standards obsession themselves not. Um, and in my recent discussions, I'm also not really seeing that. It's more uh, classic paradigms, right? So classic paradigms, for example, um, about interconnection and about other things. How do we assure that, um, uh, you know, if we have our own platform and Vodafone has their own platform, that these platforms can actually uh, be, be jointly used? Um, and I think there are two aspects of uh, why I think it doesn't really matter. The first one is um, if you expose it properly um, and, you know, well-described API and SDK on top of it, it doesn't really matter. If anyone, you know, wants to address multiple um, providers in big markets, they are big players and, you know, verticals that are in certain markets, they just use three SDKs in the beginning, you know, and, and get started and we'll see how it develops. Um, or you kind of meet in smaller um, smaller groups, you know, the innovative uh, people in three carriers can just sit together and say, hey, we have this idea, do you want to join? Uh, one of them joins, one of them doesn't, but he, you know, doesn't mind connecting their trunks, getting a bit more traffic. And you actually just start in the market, see where it goes. 
And if it, if it gets traction, you kind of sit together and think of whether you want to standardize or let's say formalize it. You know, standardization is an overused term, but I would say you can still formalize it and it can eventually evolve um, in some de facto standard as we see AWS did and as we even say Twilio with, uh, with Trimble did. But I think it, it's definitely wrong to hold yourself back waiting for a standard first before trying things out. Um, and I think also um, rethinking some of the classic carrier paradigms is necessary, like interconnect and like like many other things. And I think people are open for it. I think um, at least in my discussions, it's these days it's significantly less um, kind of um, like like uh, convincing needed. It's just that the explanation is needed. So once you explain that there are certain types of interconnect that made sense in the past, and there are certain types of interconnect how the world works now, how the you know other communication service providers uh, that are usually called OTTs, how they interconnect and that there is actually no need to directly interconnect the backends, but you can, and we, uh, by the way, at Immer, we, we, we try to do the very same. We, we try to fill the gap that RCS couldn't, right? We were essentially interconnected on the backend, on the lowest common denominator, but you could innovate without any dependent um, client server side because this was kind of proprietary, but in the end, um, since you own client and server, it doesn't matter, you know, and if you have an SDK, it doesn't also matter for others. That's the, we see this work uh, throughout the internet, why wouldn't it work for carriers? Mm -hmm. So I think just uh, being open and, and redefining certain things and, and, you know, trying things out, it's not expensive to try it out. You cannot, you don't even have the classic case of cannibalization if you put a Z-Pass on top, because every single minute is an additional minute, and every single minute earns you this, uh, what I presented, this fraction of more um, percentage on your revenue because you kind of, um, yeah. get more than you would get for a for, for classic minute. Or you're actually at least able to ask for more. So I think there's not really, it's like a no risk move. There is not really any risk in trying it out. Um, it's not expensive to get started. Uh, we've heard some of the companies earlier, Vaso or, or Telestax that provide platforms um, that you can host, or even take from the cloud, connect your trunks and you're done and you can get started. And I don't see any reason um, for being held back. Uh, held back. Um, and um, I think We've seen this in TETS, you know, we've met there uh, when I was um, in Slovak Telecom and also now you meet with many other carriers, but it's those people that go to these events that actually agree on, on the, you know, in, in that there is not really any big competition amongst them. It's just like put it out there, um, compete with your services, but the enablement we can all do because we all have also the same zip trunks. You know, there is no, yeah. there's quality differentiation, but not really API differentiation. And I think that's somehow, um, yeah, uh, where it can no, lead to. So I think it's I, really somehow... I, Mindset shift. That's, uh, I, I think I think I learned that the hard way. So I, um, you know, I met Mark first because we were both involved in um, the the uh, you know one API in its early days, yeah. and and I think you know the company I was working for at the time, and I'm not sure about you, Mark, but we were quite obsessed with the standard, and and, and we rapidly realised that nobody cared <laughs> as long as you had a good SDK. Yeah. I, I can connect, and I was like, oh, maybe we've been uh, doing something wrong <laughs> now. <laughs> And I think it's funny, look, if you, if you go back historically, the telecoms yeah. industry is somewhat relied on standards to establish connectivity. And, and, and this is why I'm now kind of, Sebastian, I'm sorry, but I'm a 50 something year old male and I can't hear the acronym RCS without giggling. Because we've gone past that now because, you know, again, you could, there was a standard, yet other groups did different things. And I, I, I look at the explosions of apps like, uh, you know, WhatsApp and WeChat in Asia in particular. You know, one of the things that on a device which Alan Quayle held, which allowed him to be able to enter a code in and validate right that particular endpoint on that particular IP address or that particular port number is, is, is indeed Alan Quayle. And then the rest of it just becomes pure IP. I mean, I think the thing that then becomes more interesting from a standards perspective, it isn't so much about the establishing of the connectivity. It's about creating a user experience. And this is what we're seeing with 5G and edge computing. And, you know, I, I just wonder if, you know, for example, I, I continually wonder why I look at the uh, Dinesh, the, the, the idea mark uh, case study, uh, you know, where, where that's been, you know, phenomenally successful ecosystem of app developers and, you know, people who created businesses and made money on top of a telecoms API problem and possibly uniquely in the world, I, I, I kind of want to say. And I, I sort of draw a parallel with what we saw with mobile money. Um, you know, 10 years ago, I was talking about, I don't understand why banks don't become MBNOs. And, and yet the one place in the world where the mobile, you know, the actual network operators themselves somewhat got involved with the financial industry in a consumer and activity perspective 
was Eastern Africa and Kenya with M-Pesa. We haven't seen that replicated anywhere in the world either. And I kind of wonder if, you know, one of the things that we have within telecoms is despite the fact that, you know, in the internet, it's IP and it's global, with telecoms, it still tends to be really siloed inside particular countries or particular geographies uh, with particular, you know, markets that they're serving that are, that are somewhat homogenous. Um, and, I, and I guess, you know, I still wonder whether that's still holding that. I mean, I'm stunned, for example, at some of the margins Sebastian's presentations suggested that Twilio were getting out of, you know, the core basic services of SMS imports. You know, if, if you're looking at margins of, well, I think, Sebastian, 300%, yeah, that's like compared to you know some list price I had as reference, um, and uh, and actually yeah. even more interesting, you know, there's the so-called OTT traffic, like web RTC to web RTC. There's also a price tag on that, where you would say as a technician, understanding how it works, well, that's ridiculous. How can people pay for it? But actually, you don't pay for the actual connection, but you pay for convenience for not having to you know develop the standards for not, and so on and so on. So there is some a package that comes with it, um, and that kind <laughs> of. So that's the thing where I think the telcos have really missed the boat because you know we've all and certainly Craig and I and the Dinesh have been involved on the on the sort of the vendor side going to sell, trying to sell into telcos. And yes, there's always that classic, oh, we need to understand the business case. And then we need to weigh up the business case against the fact that we've got 14 or 18 million subscribers who are paying us 50 bucks a month or 30 bucks a month or 20 bucks a month for basic service. And this is going to be a rounding error um, versus turn around and say, hey, we can take an existing utility that you currently provide, and instead of selling it at, at you know, a 5% margin or a 2% margin, we can sell it at a 300% margin. I, I kind of wonder if, is, if Craig, and go back to your former career in, in, in being a, working for a vendor rather than a network, whether we missed the boat <laughs> in trying to create the business cases. Because, you know, what's happening is, is now often the operators are missing the boat. I mean... I, we're sitting here on a, um, I, I don't know if we're allowed to name it, Alan. Yes, of course. It's they begin with Z or Z yeah. if you're American. And, uh, you know, and, and I, I heard some statistic that suggested that in the, in the first couple of weeks of March, that particular vendor's subscribers grew by, you know, two orders of magnitude in terms of registered account holders, not all paid subscribers. But, yeah. um, you know, we've seen recently the acquisition of Blue Jeans by Verizon. Mm hmm you know, which, which is really a big, a big acquisition in this particular time. Oh, yeah. And um, need, none of which rely on anything other than fundamental and IP layer. I mean, yep. we're sitting here and I'm on a, a Star Hub Fiber Network in, in Singapore. Craig, you're in KL on, I guess, a TM or a, or a, or a Cellcom service. Um, Dinesh, you're probably on a dialogue service. Alan, I can only guess what sort of rubbish you're on in New Jersey. And I'm assuming that, that Sebastian's on some sort of DT style provided service. But we're all completely, you know, we're not talking about compatibility. No, we're not worried about whether my device talks to your device. We've got a pretty seamless and, and really cohesive service. Yeah. And the user experience is really quite good. Yeah. And, and, and I think as point developers, time, we got stuck on standards. Yeah, and we yeah, should yeah. be talking about user experiences and value. Exactly. And but, there's several points that, there. Cause that, I that, Sorry, that lower layer that you're talking about doesn't work without standards. That has to have the standards. It's as you go up the stack to this layer where yeah. you can come. Craig, it's IP, it's done. Yeah. <laughs> what we exactly. now have is quality of service. But and I'm taking the, service the point of service is not working. But there's a good important question you asked there, Mark, to Dinesh around IDMR. Because IDMR yeah, yeah. is a great example of a telco being successful in creating a vibrant ecosystem and linking to a very important point that Sebastian made in his presentation around suitable abstractions. So it wasn't just the API, it was the simple web forms, templates, that made it very easy for a broad base of the Sri Lankan uh, sort of, uh, you know, economy to take part in Idea Mart. So I'm interested, you know, because Dinesh made this happen. I'm interested in your view, Dinesh, why it hasn't become a cookie cutter across Asia. Right. So actually, yeah, it's interesting. I'll kind of give a little bit of a background when we actually started. I think it's worthwhile. Yeah. And I think, uh, again, going back to uh, Martin, what you mentioned about how the, the traditional telco mentality of, you know, what it is, right? I think that's where are the, the key differentiators. So when we went and pitched this to uh, Dialog, 
almost two times we were told that you know the business case will not fly so i think you know very similar case like what you talked about then we went and said okay no problem we'll give it to you 100% revenue share so we don't want anything we will actually completely do a revenue share because uh, we were trying to do license revenue share all that you know didn't, didn't really work and uh, that point i think they were they were interested but i think so that was one part how we were able to get in but i think the second most important is finding that champion within the operator that would actually go out and take a chance and that's where we had the, the head of digital services so, you know he had been on our panels before alan uh, you know anthony rodrigo he actually is the one who actually put his neck down and say okay let's do it but the way he did was i think even very important what he did was he did not put the whole cpas under the vasty he actually created a separate entity to look at for idm so if you really look at that was the turning point so it was not your traditional vast thinking uh because when actually when we went when we proposed to our a proposal was that okay we want to give at least 80 to 90% revenue to the developers which telcos would never accept right i mean you you will unthinkable unbelievable right i mean that's so but then we we said no if you if you are to do this because you are not going to have your traditional ways of thinking so we actually had a playbook that we wanted to kind of a try it out so when we came and gave that whole thing and said oh, and then uh, ultimately they agreed it was 70 30 to the developers which was unheard during that time anywhere with any operator and um, then it is also a little bit of a long tail because it's not something you put and you switch it on and you know everything goes well because Anthony had a separate team he actually gave them a KPI on what he wanted to see so this team was completely different from your traditional telco uh, guys which you know like what Martin you mentioned you know from the use case to this is you know we not really looking at this team was really working and engaging the developers so during the first part the first 6 months actually we had a developer evangelist that was given by us because if you look at when do most of these guys do programming you know or at what you know so it could be 11 12 1 in the morning and if you want to get help you know there's no i mean you're you're, you're off for the day so uh, so we gave a developer evangelist you know kind of a support guy who would answer their questions when the developers wanted it so those were the couple of criteria that really made it and once developers started making money it was snowballing right i mean now you're kind of a push it all the way up and then once you start getting momentum and even today i mean it had little bit plateaued but for almost three years it was growing almost 20 percent month on month and i think there's a uh, GSMA had a case study and you know it, it talked about how much a percentage of top line revenue was idea mark um, contributing so idea mark so so that's just a kind of background but coming back to what you asked um, then after that actually not only in um, in in Sri Lanka with Alok Asiata even Robi Asiata actually took that so now today actually Robi Asiata is also having a similar growth and similar developer engagement so the the beauty was that we had actually a playbook that was built because it's it's all about how you do that i mean it's uh, it, you know we had the playbook we were able to go in but we needed to kind of uh, localize it to the bangladesh market it was not what we did in sri lanka that we were able to go and plug it in and but we worked similarly they had a fantastic team from robi asiata side they put them on on the on the ground whether it's in in, in Dhaka or in Chittagong so we actually build that and it is actually I mean the the uh, the Robi product actually it's called BD apps is actually growing a uh, similar um, 15 to 20 percent month on month growth and uh, again you see a similar kind of thing so it's not a it's not magic but I think going back to what uh, Sebastian and Martin mentioned it's all about how you change your mindset within the organization if you find the right people and you know they they are if 
they cannot be on the telco mindset. I said they need to be more on what uh, Sebastian you mentioned in your thing is like the IT mindset, but you have to, you know, it's not the small circle, it needs to be more converged circle that you need to do. I suspect though, Dinesh, that they weren't just of the mindset, they were actually empowered with their within their organizations to make those decisions and or uh, influence the folks who could make those decisions to make it happen. And I, I think, sadly, we haven't seen that in a lot of other operators around the world. If we have, yeah. it's been pretty short-lived. And I think the way to do that as a, as, as a kind of a C-level, what they should think is, okay, the problem with innovation teams, like, you know, I, I think we have seen so many innovation teams in Telcos never goes anywhere because what you do is it's like, you know, you take a bank and you make him uh, the head of the venture capital arm, you know, and, you know, so you also think the same way as you how you were doing, giving loans for venture capital. Similarly, what most of the telcos does is, you know, take somebody from a very traditional telco and makes him the head of the innovation arm and give him this and you know you, you never still change anything out of that. I think what uh, what both you, Mark and Dinesh said, I think it's, it is like this and I'm, I wouldn't even say that, for example, DT hasn't tried it, right? With Emirate, it was exactly like that. We had in the beginning our internal champion. We actually did a kind of carve out, but in the end, let's say when the potato was too hot, it was just dropped, right? And what I, what always, what always, and I've, you know, spoken about it, so no need to revise it. We've had this in two years ago. But what I think is always um, uh, the biggest issue is, and we see this also here, what, what Mark said, talking about RCS in a way. I'm also not a big fan, and there is a track record online where I also, you know, leave my fair share of criticism on it. But I think, why can't we do both? You know, why can not, why can't the core people and the people believe in RCS not do what they think, but not exclude you know, a small group of people that thinks we should do more, you know. I think there is nothing wrong perceived of evolving the lowest common denominator, and if it takes 10 years, so be it, right? But that shouldn't stop us, and that's the most important point. It shouldn't stop us that want to do more, you know, to get started now. And very small, you know, not we don't need the same budget. We, we actually literally don't need it. We don't need it ourselves, but we also don't need it to do what we want to do, right? Um, get started slowly and actually uh, do both and see what works. Uh, there is... Uh, I think there is always this fear of, um, uh, you know, cannibalization and other stuff. I think with CPAS, less than with other stuff. With Imru, we had this more. But um, I think carriers did this, in my experience, uh, at least what I saw in, in Slovakia and also now, pretty well with television, right? They, they evolved quite a bit. We have an, um, an access-free television product. So you can download an app, pay five euro a month in DT, and get access to the telecom offer that, that costs otherwise, I don't know what. You know, I'm not a TV subscriber, but there we manage it because the legacy people weren't holding us back. In voice, it's the complete opposite. There is, a, there is, you know, there is so much governance that you you could do it even technically, even on top of an IMS if you would want to, but it's just not done because the legacy mindset, and that's the, the key point also, Dinesh, what you said, the mindset is not there, right? The mindset is there in other areas that were built up and not in those that we've historically kind of inherited. And I think that's the key point that needs to change. And I don't even think it needs to be revolutionary that we do now completely switch, but just let us do, you know, if somebody wants to build a CPAS or whatever, has a good idea, doesn't need a lot of money, uh, you know, just let them do it and, and uh, you know, open internal doors and, and, and see what, um, what you can actually achieve, right? Um, and not achieve in like, I don't know, a couple of weeks, but really say, go out there, um, take some money and see if you can build up something that may not be significant in, 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 in the figure, like in actual numbers we've spoken about, there's magnitudes in between Twilio and also Carrier, but in this space, if you can generate some value on top of you know, the voice business and so on, if you can, the decline is not that big. The decline we've seen into Carrier is a couple of percent. And I really believe that we can, we can uh, push this upwards to a small growth if we really say uh, we have a more modern way of offering our assets, we, we try to get there. We won't be the latest and greatest, but actually we have offer for companies like ING, for other companies that actually say, I want higher quality. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to actually pay uh, a small a bit of a fraction more. I don't need the latest, greatest. I want something by the partner I already have, and that is and that is the carrier. And I think there's nothing wrong in doing this. We see that there is not just Twilio, but there is other, you know, CPAS providers. WebRTC is democratize everything. We've spoken about this, you know, day in, day out uh, for many years. And I think we really... There's not not a big problem in just getting started and do it and see where it goes, right? The, the, yeah. the entry level is is so small and and um, yeah, I really think it's it's it just you just need to do it and and there is nothing nothing holding you back. You can still do RCS those who do it. You can still uh, want to insist on a standard once it's there. You can still try to get the market feedback, but just let's get started. If you have somebody uh, you know trying to trying to get you started on it. 
Yeah, I think that's I think a very one powerful point there, Sebastian, is that you know it's not so much about the APIs and the standards; it's about what you can create in terms of momentum, in terms of user experience and product. Yeah, but it's this both because there, there is you know we there's a standard or there is a you know industry perceived approach, and nothing else can be done apart from this interest perceived approach. And I think that both is very powerful. But taking on from what uh, Dinesh was saying, and it sort of reminds me of, you know, the recipe for family, happy families. There's, you know, there's very few recipes for happy families, while there's countless recipes for unhappy families. It's sort of, you know, when we look at, you know, the success that has been created, it's in having a corporate champion, in having the right people that are empowered. And let's face it, the people that created the idea mark success in Sri Lanka, I mean, like Shafraz, has been hired by Google and is running dev relations across Southeast Asia. So, you know, they were fortunate in the people that have gone on and achieved success. And I just wanted to sort of you know, take that on to your three-step plan. First step is clear. We've got you know, providers, we've got open source, you know, just putting the API, slapping them on top, that's easy, that's done. Then in your step two, you had aggregation. Now, again, part of what our, our telcos do is you know, interop, uh, you know, aggregation is there. But, and we've discussed some of the challenges, the legacy mindsets and all the rest. In your mind, when you're doing these three steps, from you know open source done aggregation to fairy dust what entity is it that you see doing this aggregation is it telcos is it a consortium what is it you see taking these step two and step three forward Martin? well the, the most natural would be the carrier from mm -hmm. my perspective um and is it depending on the size of the carrier and the, let's say the geography uh, uh, some carriers just have a one country footprint others do have uh, mm -hmm. like a continent footprint or even bigger so depending on the size I would say it's uh, like the bigger carriers with a with a let's say a pretty big comparable footprint let's say that way right mm -hmm. uh, I think in like North America or Europe or uh, in Asia it's a little different there because they're countries really are big some like much bigger than for instance european countries like it's like like the whole country is bigger than europe as such right so yeah. it's a that that depends but they're they're actually depending on the footprint i the most natural thing would be carrier uh, from my perspective and not just using their own assets uh, the trunks right they, what they have and the contracts they have in the entire um and the uh, with using it with other carriers trunks uh but Apart from the fact that they would be the natural solution, I see uh, there could be some others. There, uh, there are aggregation companies. Mm -hmm. um, so the aggregators could be interesting because they are further developed in the software approach. Let's say that way. So they, 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 they have. It's easier for them to think about. Let's say, uh, let's uh, create a, a layer of software that uh, aggregates different. Uh, providers mm -hmm. and uh, expose it in a way that for the consuming party it is basically the same right so they could come up now this the easiest thing is because I mentioned AT&T and KPN right they they have their uh, API stores where they already have a, some piece of software where they it's a simple like they have user management right you go there you sign up and then they, they just manage your account then you can have one application in this, or you can have multiple applications. You can have access to uh, APIs that not just do communication, but other things. Uh, and that's that's basically aggregation. In this, in those cases, it's it's carriers. Uh, but uh, on a on a low level, it's the aggregators. And now, if you look at the the CPaaS people, they uh, they do this as well. They have they have contracts. Like if you take the, the leaders like Nexmo and and and, and Twilio. Um, the numbers are not known, or actually not really known, but uh, it's said that the Twilio has contracts with more than 100 carriers, mm -hmm. right? So what they do is already an aggregation, right? So you as the consuming party, you go there, you sign up, and you want to develop an app, and you want to make a phone call from uh, North America to Europe, right? And they have contracts with, I don't know, 5, 10, 15 different providers 
that would give you the option to do this call, right? And uh, then they can give you the best price, but they don't give you the best price. They give you a fixed price, right? And and then they choose the, the cheapest, right, they have. And uh, that's clever, right? That's clever. So it's really smart to do this. And uh, I don't see why this, uh, why the other guys should not be part of the game and only the one. And that's why I point out that what we see is the from the consuming body. So I don't think about the carrier now. I think from the other direction, right? That's that's what we do most of the time. Uh, ah. So we, we don't do this for the carriers. We, we, we actually help the consuming bodies. Um, and... If, they, if you look at the consuming party, at the moment, there's no central offering. So there are lots of providers and you just, you know, you're left alone with the decision you have to make, right? You, I just want to make phone calls. Why is that so complicated? The first and most natural thing would you go to your uh, support, your local carrier, right? So uh, go there and then you look at it and it's like, mm -hmm, no, I have to make a contract wholesale department. And I need to have a developer that is able to do zip. Fucking hell, I have JavaScript developers. I have, I don't know, I have developers, but I don't have zip experts, right? And that's the gap, right? So it's a, there is a gap in software stack. That's it. It's not complex. It's not difficult. But there are a lot of uh, uh, developers that can, like the usual suspect languages, develop the usual suspect languages. And there are just a few doing zip. And there, there's a huge market providing zip infrastructure. And there is a small market providing SDKs and APIs, and uh, I think I have a slide where I, we see this this you know, this, this, this this connection, and uh, the, the, the Twilio and likes they just uh, they're good because they can they they are the first uh, place to go, and that's why they can choose the cheapest and give you the same price, and um, this 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 should be liberalized, I would say, um, because for the consuming parties for the for the consumers it's basically. For the companies that consume these assets, yeah. it's a difficult situation. So uh, that's, um, but still, uh, uh, we don't really see a lot of carriers moving this way. Uh, some aggregators uh, in, in London, we had a discussion about this, right? There were some yeah. aggregators already providing um, at, on top of their aggregation what they do, anyways, because they are aggregators. Yeah. They stop providing software that is uh, supporting programm programmable uh, concepts. Exactly. Right. I think it's it's a moving target at the moment, but the the most natural players that the carriers are not really there. So exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's interesting you talk about the interconnection. I mean, one of the things in the in the, the traditional carrier model, one of the things that we always found was that you know a, a carrier with its core business, which is origination and termination within its own network, or potentially within its own within a domestic market. Um, you know, they're, they're working with at most one domestic interconnect point. Um, and so when they look at the API business, they say, well, we don't want to, we, you know, we, we, we don't want to take away from that business. And that's always the thing. That's, a, that's their bread and butter. That's their core focus. Um, one of the things which is kind of interesting about Sebastian's presentation, in particular the representation of, say, Twilio's margins for, you know, origination and termination, particularly voice and SMS, was that, you know, if you look at the use cases in a bunch of the, you know, commonly used communication apps, consumer apps today, is that the two-factor authentication, which is the classic use case, which is probably, you know, I, I want to say probably, you know, Twilio probably floated the company on top of two-factor authentication for Uber, just quietly, right? Um, but, but that's a transaction which takes place at the commencement of a, uh, you know, the, the onboarding or the, the, the you know, creation of the customer account, and probably doesn't happen that often after that. You know, whereas for a, for a domestic carrier, um, you know, be it, you know, Deutsche Telekom or, or Telstra or Starhub or Singtel or something, that communication back and forth is something that they monetize on a daily basis. So when they've been, they've been fearing cannibalization of that, what they really haven't been able to do is just, you know, look at the fact that, well, realistically, their interconnection pieces, you know, the fact that I'm in Singapore and I want to make a phone call to Craig in, 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 in Malaysia, there's an interconnect relationship between two carriers involved. Sometimes that's the most profitable part of a telco. So they've taken their bread and butter. They say we don't want to cannibalize that. Whereas a lot of the um, a lot of the you know the, the aggregators, the the over the top players have basically gone and done uh, interconnect agreements with lots and lots and lots of them, admittedly at smaller volumes, but able to do it really cheaply. And you know again, we're still talking about the basics 
we're kind of almost trying to bypass an existing carrier with a SIP provider or something to be able to do cheap calls a basic you know, as a really simple use case. And again, I draw the, I draw the parallel with the FinTech folks, but they're looking at something different altogether. They're looking at user experiences and customer outcomes, which are on a different planetary scale compared to just let's have some money and let's move from here to there. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Cause that, uh, that's that's something that, that as a communications industry, I'd love to see a lot more innovation being focused on because you know, we are not going to change the demons inside a lot of incumbent operators no. at this stage without the luck of getting as, as Dinesh did in, in Sri Lanka, you know, a champion who was, who got it, who was the right personality, who could influence the powers that be to allow them to open the keys to the network and go, because that just, as much as you can define the roles and say, yep, that's what we need. How many countries have we not found it? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, because at Ted Summit EMEA last year, we had several of the fintech folks in that were discussing exactly that point, Mark, around how, you know, the, how the regulation came into play in opening up the banks to allow this explosion of fintech companies and customer-centric banking. Uh, so I think, you know, it is an interesting model, uh, whether it could be replicated in telcos or not i think the problem is again it's highly regulatory dependent and that's years and years and years so yeah you know, I, I think there is an analogy there you know we we did discuss it and it is a very different dynamic it creates in the industry so definitely i think it, it's interesting and should be explored to martin's point around the aggregators when we use that word it, it's for a whole category of different companies and you've got aggregators like Bix that, you know, quite telco centric. There's then, you know, aggregators like Cinch that, you know, are semi telco because again, you know, they do provide quality of service from the messaging. So you can actually have different sort of qualities around their uh, messaging APIs uh, and have made a whole range of acquisitions, you know, it's particularly regionally. I mean, they, re they, you know, they bought Wavy, in North America now, they bought SAP's uh, assets in this space. So now they have direct carrier interconnect uh, rather than having to go through uh, SDI. So, you know, I, we are starting to see some moves. Uh, but, you know, again, it's, I guess I'll, I'll wrap up because uh, we could discuss for hours and hours on this topic. <laughs> in your three step plan, uh, what time period? Do you see, you know, the industry being able to move through that? I mean, the, the open source step one, it's done. You know, it's there, it's available. That's what you're doing and facilitating a whole range of different players in the market today, Martin. But steps two and three, over what time period do you think that's possible? Well, well, possible would be very fast. It's a, it should not be a problem because it's all a matter of software, software mm -hmm. development or even the introduction of software that's already existing. So uh, that's the two specific, like what would be the shortest time of doing it would be a year, I would say one year. Uh, <laughs> but reality is that yeah. the decision-making and really making it and really doing it and the recognizing it as something meaningful. Well, I, I think just a few people will do so. And you just mentioned uh, Bix and uh, Cinch. Uh, it's a good examples. Uh, um, Cinch even more than Bix, but even Bix that, is, is a kind of a almost carrier style company. They have licenses and they do geography and stuff like that, but, but they, have, they have so much better software stack uh, to be in that place compared to most of the carriers uh, that it would be easy for them to really go for it. Uh, I think it's really, the question here is not how fast the carriers would actually move up the ladder of providing uh, more software stack stuff. It's the question is how fast is the market changing from people going to a store and buying a SIM card, sticking it into a smartphone and thinking that's the precondition for me to communicate, right? Um, and uh, you mentioned a couple of services, I think that they're all known. Um, that's, uh, the question is more like how fast are we going to move to a space where that piece of hardware, right? It's nothing you could sell. 
Yeah. And that's the question. As soon as you cannot sell that little piece of hardware, that's why the carriers, they stick, they love it, right? They really love it because it's something you can sell and stick it in somewhere and then it's worth that you connect it and you can call to make, uh, for instance, a phone call, a service that works all the time. You yeah. can call any other number that is in the same structure. Mm -hmm. Now, the user gives a shit on whether this is via old, good old fashioned telephony technology or via internet technology or a mixture of both. So the user does not decide on this. The user decides on what kind of app they want to use because they like it. And if that app is not connected to what the carriers sell anymore as the SIM card, then the carriers have to be fast and then they will move. Uh, depending from, like it's, it, I, I, mean, I, can, I can only say it like Europe, um, the carriers are really, really in a, in a strong position still, right? Uh, there are other markets that, where it's different. Um, like in China, you know, there's basically one app. Everyone is using one app. And, uh, and yeah, like everything is banking is in there, social networks is in there, communication is in there, everything. Maybe two, so that's but a totally I see your point. Yeah, but that's a totally different situation, right? Like uh, I, if my parents could not call me by taking their fixed line phone and call me, right? Then they, then they would use that one app too because they just want to call me, right? They want to talk to me. And uh, so I think it's more like uh, there is there's going to be fast pain if on the service on the on the on the user level using services uh, there is there are solutions that get even more dominant than the ones we see already, and uh, then I guess that the carrier would move because they see their uh, selling SIM cards market breaking down. That's what I what I would say. So it's a, it can take ages in Europe. I'm afraid it will take a long time because. People like their SIM cards, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of small countries, you know, have still having some barriers. Yeah. Even, though. but that's that's what I would say. It's like say technically it could be fast, but uh, from uh, another perspective, I think it's more that the market decides on how to. Uh, excellent. Fast the broken. That's an excellent point, Dinesh. Do you want to say something? Yeah, just uh, just a uh, quick. I, I was just wondering because of this current situation, what people are going going through, and also I think. Uh, uh, Sebastian, you talk about, you know, the uh, Julios and, you know, the, how their financial situation, they have been burning money for, from the time they went, went IPO. Um, what do you think from a panel perspective, what are some of the CPAS opportunities? Because I think one thing that you mentioned, Sebastian, also that you have not seen any um, companies that are coming from Asia that has really kind of taken over some of these new new ways of uh, from a CPAS perspective. I thought it may be interesting because uh, things may change. I think uh, within this kind of uh, scenarios that we are we are into, I think it would be it would be good to see or at least start thinking there are maybe some new innovations that are going to come out of this uh, the pandemic that we are going through and CPAS you know being made mainly on communication and what we are doing today. And I think those will grow and grow and people will have, be able to incorporate a lot of these kind of uh, apps into their own things through APIs. You know, I just want to get some thoughts from anybody. Yeah, look, it's an interesting point, Tinesh, because I, I guess, you know, we saw the acquisition last year of um, WaveCell in, here in Singapore by AFI8. Uh, and, and that was kind of like the first you know, a sort of consolidation or sort of starting to roll up of um, uh, UCAS or UC sort of platforms we've seen really much much of in Asia. There's been a couple of smaller ones. PCCW bought a, a, a provider in Canada, I think, of a, or a software provider a year or two ago. Um, you know, I, I think the, 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 the opportunity going forward is there's, there's a lot of folks doing stuff and starting to do communications technologies here that, sorry, more broadly in Asia, which is, you know, realistically 21 different, very, very different markets and very different levels of, you know, capability, maturity, technologies and such. Um, I do see there will be uh, continued innovation. I, I don't see at any one, like there'll be no single API. I'm sorry, but had we seen that, it would have emerged by now. And potentially, if it has, it's emerged from something that's completely over the top. It's someone who's using maybe WhatsApp APIs, as we've seen in businesses are doing that now. Um, it's someone who's maybe doing some sort of over-the-top service with uh, two-factor authentication using nearly any uh, SMS termination provider to achieve that outcome. 
And at that point, I don't see the operators getting involved anymore, to be honest. Um, you know, I, I'd like to be proven wrong. I'd like to think there's still a bunch of innovation available um, in the old uh, in the old world. Uh, I, I just don't know that it's going to be there anymore. I think they, they're going to be surpassed. Yeah. But I think that's an interesting point that Dinesh is raising in terms of what we're experiencing, what the world is experiencing, consumers are experiencing, is that the telco is no longer implicitly connected to telecoms. You can get yeah. the telecom services and people are, you know, let's face it, you know, my son is on Zoom at the moment with his online school. So he's spending the vast majority of his day using telecommunications in a way that he's never, you know, kids have never experienced before. So it sort of, I think Dinesh's comment and then with Martin was saying in terms of once people see this, you know, they don't need that physical item. And you know, let, let's look at Japan, where Line is now an MVNO. It's in a dominant position. People use it. You know, if you're in the teen market, 95% of the market is using uh, Line. Uh, yeah. So again, and that's where we've seen the telcos actually cooperate on RCS. They call it Plus Message. They're claiming 15 million, you know, users. Uh, but you know, we won't go down into that. I mean, there's actually a white paper from the GSMA on it. GSMA have some you know, uh, webinars they're running at the moment around this to basically show how successful uh, Japan's been. But I think it's, it is interesting that the criteria that Martin has stated, I, I wholeheartedly agree with. I think that you know, to Dinesh's point, you know, Asia could be because of its diversity, because of how people have been woken up to the fact that telco and telecom you know, are not implicitly linked anymore. I think it creates a very interesting situation over the next couple of years for innovators, whether it comes from an existing business, one of the aggregators, or it comes from a completely new business that is trying to disrupt this relatively staid now CPAS market. I think creates an interesting dynamic uh, over the next couple of years. But we are over an hour, guys. I know we can talk for a long time, but what I would like to do is to thank you all for spending the time this evening, this afternoon, and morning for me to have a discussion around the Universal uh, Telecom API in Asia. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Alan. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye.